Hi, my name is Shivali Batuk. I'm a freshman in high school and I'm the founder and president of Trival Youth Music Group. Hi, my name is Shruti Kale. I'm a sophomore in high school and I am a group member of the Trival Youth Music Group. Hi, my name is Isha Mitchell. I'm an eighth grader and I'm also a member of the Trival Youth Music Group. We're super excited to interview our guest speaker, Mr. Regani, the band teacher at Pine Valley Middle School. Before we get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Tri-Valley Youth Music Group. The Tri-Valley Youth Music Group is all about spreading joy in the community through music, while giving opportunities to the youth to showcase their talents. Additionally, the Tri-Valley Youth Music Group would like to bring awareness to different music programs by interviewing various music professionals from public and private institutions. If our interviews can convince even one person to join their school's music programs, it will make a huge difference because the funding of public school's music programs depend on student enrollment numbers. We hope to provide informational content to youth interested in music. So let's get started. It would be great if you could introduce yourself, Mr. Ghani, and tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. All right, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for having me this evening. It's uh, great to be here. It's great to see former students and, and see what you're doing. Um, and I'm excited that you're trying to spread the word out there and get more people involved in their music program, which is awesome. Um, so I'm Mr. Rugani. I teach at Pine Valley Middle School. This is my 10th year at Pine Valley Middle School, and it's my uh, 14th year teaching total. Um, and I've taught, let's see, I've taught every grade except I don't think I believe I don't, haven't taught third grade. Um, no, wait, I think I did teach third grade. All right. But in, in my career over, over that time, I've taught from kindergarten through high school. Um, I've taught in a district. Um, I taught when I first started in a district, I taught at San Ramon Valley High School. I co-taught with Cheryl Yee Glass. And I um, at the same time, I taught at Hidden Hills Elementary School. And I taught kindergarten, first grade there. And then I taught in that position for three years. And um, I think it was a second year, I taught a jazz band at Windermere Ranch Middle School. And then um, I left to go to Boston when my wife was working on her, on her um, graduate work um, at New England Conservatory. And I, so I took a year leave from our district and um, I went to Boston. I didn't get a permanent job there. I basically substituted for a year. Uh, but I had a long-term sub position from January through June um, when I was there. And uh, so I had taken a leave so I could still come back to the district. I just wasn't guaranteed the same position. So then when I came back, I started working at Pine Valley and I was also working at Walt Disney and Country Club. And um, I continued to do that for uh, a few years. And then uh, the program at Pine Valley started to expand. And so I started to add more classes and then I couldn't continue to work at Walt Disney. Um, so then I started work just at Country Club and Pine Valley, and then um, the classes grew even more. And so then at this point, I'm only teaching at Pine Valley. Uh, it took me eight, eight years to get to the point, I guess seven years to get to the point of, of being able to teach um, all at Pine Valley. Um, and I was helping to teach drama there, uh, co-teaching with Mrs. Schlentz for a couple of years. And then um, actually last year was the first year that I have had a full-time job at Pine Valley that's just music related because we added another. So now um, I'm teaching only at Pine Valley and only music um, and only instrumental because I have taught choir and, and whatnot before. So that's all instrumental and it's strings and band classes. So um, it's been really great to see how much um, it has grown over, over the, that time. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's really cool. And um, I've been playing music and participating in music basically my whole life since second grade. So I've been um, involved in taking. I'm a percussionist, so I've been taking drum lessons and percussion lessons since I was seven. And uh, um, it's been great. All my friends are musicians, uh, except for the friends that I've had since before I was in second grade, which I still have. My best friend. We've been. Uh, We've been friends since before kindergarten. So um, we have a, a long history together. He actually played an instrument in fifth through seventh or eighth grade. So 
even a lot of my friends who aren't musicians now played music at some point when we were in middle school or high school. Um, and then as you guys know, my wife is a musician um, and our, wow. our two and a half year old son will probably be a musician because he's, <laughs> I mean, he'll have a choice, but at the same time, we'll, we'll try to get him into uh, playing music at some point. And he already at two and a half, he loves singing along with, with, uh, he loves queen and he sings along with queen and that's so cool so um yeah so my whole life has been around music and 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 everything else so yeah that's really cool i didn't know that um you taught like all grades except for third grade and that you even taught choir that's so interesting yeah um so now i like I like to know a little bit more about the music program offered at Pine Valley Middle School because like I remember as an incoming sixth grader like I was so confused by the many options for elective because you know like electives are like completely foreign to sixth graders. There were like wheel electives which had Spanish, drama, art and debate and then there was like a separate option for band I remember. So I remember that I was like contemplating whether I should continue to take band in middle school or should I take wheel electives? So why would you suggest an incoming sixth grader to take band class at middle school? How can they tell if band is for them? So, um, well, as a, as a musician and a music teacher, I'm, I'm going to always advocate for students to, to participate in music. I kind of have a bias in that, I guess. Um, but um, if you're, I guess there's two, two sides of it. If you're playing in fourth and fifth grade or even in fifth grade and you started to play an instrument, um, you've kind of already vested a little bit of time into doing that, into to learning that instrument. But you've all, probably also only had, you know, once a week for 30 minutes and then there's some weeks you don't get to see the teacher. So you haven't had a, a lot of uh, hands on time and instructional time with with your teacher. And um, so if you're already kind of committed to it and like, I want to I want to play the instrument because someone who starts in elementary school, they started playing for a reason, right? They, they started because they're interested in learning an instrument. They heard someone else play an instrument. Uh, they like music in general, and they want to be someone who participates in it. So they have that passion. So that passion gets better as you get, as you play longer and get more advanced with your, with your abilities. So if you've been doing it in elementary school, it's really nice to continue on. And because in middle school, as you know, Cheval, you get every day, you get music. Yeah. And um, which instead of having a half hour once a week, which by the time you get into class and set up your instrument and there's the take down the instrument, it's really like maybe 20 minutes of actual instruction time. Um, and I've, I've taught elementary instrumental music. So I, I know firsthand, like how many interruptions you have and how many days you're like, oh, we don't, there's a field trip, so we don't get to have band today or whatever. So when you have a designated time in your every day that you get to go go to music and learn it makes a huge difference and you you guys probably remember who've done music in sixth grade from when you come in the first day of music to the last day of school in june or, or let's say our spring concert like the amount of growth that you have within that time is huge and you learn like all the notes on your instrument and just like your ability to be able to play uh and what you can play is so huge like it's so much bigger than when you started um yeah and I remember too like um i started like band in fourth grade and the growth in sixth grade was so huge like i couldn't even play past like the first octave of c and then like eventually i could play like the high e so the growth was so much like for me so i feel like it's important to take. Yeah. Band and if you're, if, if it's someone who did not play in sixth grade, or sorry, in fourth and fifth grade or not in fifth grade, and they're coming into middle school, um, it's still a good time to start um, for a few reasons. One, uh, so because everyone who's coming from elementary school only had a, a, a not a lot of time, they didn't have that everyday instruction. Um, if you're just starting, you're not going to be hugely behind everybody else because you're going to get instruction every single day and you see the you you'd see me every day so you could ask questions every day and come after school get help so you can catch up really really quickly in 6th grade um, when you join later in middle school or high school or whatever you can still do that but the people you're playing with have a little bit more experience so you're going to be more far further behind 
but even with that said, like when students come in, uh, when I have new students in, let's say seventh grade and they haven't played an instrument before, um, I know that. So I'm not certain at the beginning of the year, I'm not expecting that they're going to be able to play the same as everybody else. So I work with them and say, okay, well, you can't play this right now, but you can play this. So let's have our tests on this and let me see how you're doing on this. And then eventually uh, I've had the students who put in um, like, they're like really committed. I'm going to learn my instrument and they've never played an instrument before by usually after the winter concert. So by January, February, they're basically caught up with everybody in the class. If, if they put in the time to do that and, it, and they're committed to do it, um, I could bring them up up to where they need to be usually by the second semester and then by the area band festival in march and by the um uh the spring concert in may they're they're playing all the notes on the page and, and whatnot sometimes before that like winter concert i'm like okay well play this part but don't play that part and sometimes we have to kind of uh adjust what they're playing um just because they're not they're not quite ad as advanced um with that but if you start in sixth grade like I said, you're not really that far behind and you can catch up because you get music every single day and everyone, we kind of go back and we start back at the beginning and I go, okay, here's how you hold your instrument. Here's how you sit. Here's how you breathe. And so we kind of start with the basics, even though a lot of students have had that. Um, when you're a beginner, you need repetition, repetition, repetition. So you need to have all that stuff over and over and over. And when when you see uh, someone for 30 minutes once a week in elementary school, sometimes by the time you come back the next week, you've forgotten, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to sit up straight. And, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to hold it like this. And so you forget those things. When I see you every day and I can call you on it and say, feet on the ground, flat on the ground, sit up straight, bring your instrument up, and I can I can do that. You fix a lot of those habits um, quicker and whatnot. Yeah, I remember you, like, telling the trumpets to, like, sit straight and stuff and, like, it's great how you're super like flexible with your students, like based on their ability. Um, so that's really good. What it, what instruments are offered at Pine Valley Middle School? Because I remember there were like differences between the instruments offered in elementary school and middle school. There are more options in middle school. So what instruments are exactly offered at Pine Valley Middle School? So at Pine Valley, we um, the typical instruments that we like have every year, basically. Um, so we have we have two areas. We have the strings and we have the band. So in the strings uh, classes, which is like orchestra, we have the violin, which is the higher instrument. We have the viola, which is the mid-range instrument. Then we have the cello, which is uh, a low bass instrument. And then we have the bass, the upright bass, which is the lowest of the instruments. Um, so within there, that, that's what we have in a string ensemble. Um, we also have a, a few piano players that are in the orchestra and in a chamber orchestra and in sixth grade strings. Um, and the thing with piano though, is it's an audition instrument, meaning that you have to already know how to play it and you have to audition to play it just because there's a lot of people who want to play piano. And um, I don't usually take the time to teach you how to play piano. I teach you how to play with the group as a pianist, but because we're learning, um, all, all this, there's a string class, we're learning the strings. Um, I'm not, I don't teach the students how to play the piano. I'm teaching them how, what they, to take what they know about how to play the piano and adapt it to now I'm playing in a large ensemble. Cause a lot of times piano players, they get very um, isolated because they play solo stuff all the time. I've known, I, when I went to college, I, the piano players, we never saw them because they never played with the band and never played with the orchestra. And then once in a while we would have a piece that they'd get to play with the band and we go, oh, it's a piano player. I mean, I had a lot of friends who were piano players and I never saw them in class, but I saw them in my theory class and my other classes and my uh, music history class. And then we hung out, out outside of school, but I didn't get to see them in my performance classes. And then once in a while, they'd come around because we had a piano piece that we had to play in wind ensemble and like, oh, yay, you're here. And it would be fun to play with them. Um, and there's more, uh, there's probably more chances that they play in orchestra than they play in band. Um, so in the strings, that's what we get. And then for the band classes, um so you have the woodwinds which are flute um and the clarinet the bass clarinet which is like the clarinet but a low version of the clarinet the alto saxophone which is the high saxophone the tenor saxophone which is mid-range but it sounds in the bass area and then the berry sax which is like the low end saxophone um and then so those those are the the main ones 
You can also play a double reed instrument, which is the oboe or the bassoon. Um, so they have two reeds rather than a reed that goes on a mouthpiece. And the though, though you can you can play those. They're a little bit more finicky, I guess I'll say, um, or temperamental instruments. They take a, a lot more patience. And usually if you play the oboe or the bassoon, you're going to want to take private lessons because they're a difficult instrument to play well without someone who, who knows how to play that instrument um, and as a professional playing instrument without them showing you how to uh, play it right and get the right tone and everything else. Those two instruments in particular are, are instruments that I highly recommend if you're going to play them, you take private lessons. Um, moving into the brass, the, in the high brass, the trumpet is the high brass. Um, then the French horn is the mid-range brass. It's kind of like the viola of the, the band. Um, and then as we move our way down, we have trombone and baritone. They, they're in the same range. They're, they're low bass clef instruments, but they, because of how they're built, they have different sounds. And then we have the tuba, which is the low bass sound in the, in the band. And then um, we do have some electric bass players in the group, which usually play like the same part as the tuba is playing. And some of our music has bass parts written in, but a lot of times they're reading the baritone um, horn part, the baritone bass bar uh, sorry baritone the brass part and they're playing that on the bass um and usually if they're playing electric bass that's also uh an audition instrument because there's so many people who want to play it and I i'll i'll teach you how to refine it and whatnot but um I i've found that if students don't have prior knowledge on bass they they kind of lose um lose interest and don't don't do really well if they don't have some prior knowledge on that and then um in the back of the room, you have percussion, which is a very large realm of things that you play. You have all the drums, all the cymbals, basically everything that you don't blow into. Um, mm. All the, the stuff that's not the wind and not the bass, it gets thrown into the percussion. And even with that, sometimes you have whistles and stuff and you blow into those. So kind of all that we call it the toys, all the toys and the xylophone and the bells and the timpani and the crash cymbals and the triangle and the tambourine and the list goes on and on and on that would be percussion um percussion based and so with percussion the thing to know about that is if you come into it um i train percussionists i don't train drummers um and i, I this is a personal philosophy because i was trained as a drummer when i growing up meaning i was trained how to play drums i was not played trained how to play percussion i mean i wasn't trained how to play timpani and the mallet instruments and all of the other things. I wasn't trained to do that until I got to college. So all of my lessons and everything, I was a, a very good drum set player and a drummer and I could play rhythms and everything just fine. And I was really good with that, but I got to college and I, I, I could play percussion pretty well, but I didn't know all of the techniques and everything else. And mm -hmm. when it came to like playing mallet instruments, I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, so I, I don't want other people to have to deal with to do that same thing. So if you if you sign up to play percussion, my th theory is you're going to play percussion. You're not going to play. So you're not going to sit there and play snare drum for every song. Um, and that's not fair to the other kids. You're like, well, I want to because a lot of times we have eight or nine students who want to play percussion, which is a lot. And we have to cycle through so everyone gets a chance to yeah, play. Yeah, I remember you yeah. have to like rotate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we have to rotate through that. Um, and make sure everyone gets a chance to play everything. So, um, yeah. So as a percussionist, you, you have to be committed to learn all of the instruments and usually percussionists don't have an issue with that. They just, they're not used to that. So in elementary school, usually they play like the snare drum, bass drum, maybe cymbals. And they don't have, a, they don't have all the instruments in elementary school for them to play. So they they come to middle school, um, just they have to know that they're not going to just play drums the whole time they will play drums but like my first thing is when you're sixth grader i'm like okay you're learning how to play mallet instruments and read music that's your first task we're not even touching the the, the snare drum until later in the semester or the year um so we always start the first part of the year just learning how to play bells and read the notes on the page and the rhythms there and put all that together and then we kind of start to focus on the other parts of the percussion wow those are like that's a lot of options for instruments. So how would a student go about choosing an instrument from all those options? So, well, there, there's the way that they would normally in a normal circumstance without COVID. Um, and that would be 
if they contacted me, like parents contact me via email, um, usually I'll just set up a time after school for them to come to school and I'll say, all right, what instruments are you interested in playing? Um, and I'll take them out, I'll get them ready and I'll have them try out the different instruments so they can they can see, they can hold them and feel how heavy they are. They can, uh, I did give them like a quick lesson on how to play the instrument. Like, okay, here's how you make a sound and they'll play a clarinet and a saxophone and a trumpet and a trombone. Um, not necessarily every instrument. Like they usually come in with an idea of, I wanna play a brass instrument or I'm interested in clarinet and trumpet. Okay, cool. And so I'll take those out and we try them and I give them some pointers uh, about how the, how they sound or what might work for them because not your body's not built necessarily to play every instrument. So, um, and that's just something you have to like. I don't have the lips to play flute professionally. Um, when I was learning how to play flute in college, I learned because I had to learn how to play the instruments enough to be able to teach it. I didn't have to. I wasn't have. To, I didn't have to be proficient at playing the instruments. But when I played flute. I, I was having a really hard time. So I went to one of my professors who wasn't teaching me how to play flute, but she had a doctorate in music education and I think a master's in flute performance. Um, so, and she had been playing for years. So she was like a professional flute player who got paid to play flute with high, high level people and everything. So I went to her and I said, please help me. I'm having a hard time. We sat down for 45 minutes or an hour. She helped me with some stuff. And I guess at the end, toward the end, she's like, yeah, I, I don't think you really have the lips to play the flute well, like like at professional level. And I was like, OK, I can live with that. <laughs> right. Oh, so I can wow. I can play it at a level like like middle school and, and whatnot. I can I can play it. But if we start working on higher notes and and uh, the tone and stuff, I'm, I'm not going to be a professional flute player. I don't my body's not built to play flute professionally. That's coming from a professional flute player and and lots of troubleshooting going with that and i'm like okay i can accept that so yeah, some students might be sorry sir Valley, what were you gonna say yeah i i didn't know that like you had to have like a certain you know um body to do like some instruments yeah and time. most of the time it doesn't it doesn't matter um but sometimes so one of the things oh for instance if you have large lips so someone who has large lips sometimes if they want to play a french horn which has a smaller mouthpiece than the trumpet or even a trumpet, if they have large lips, they may not be very good at playing the trumpet. But if you put them over on trombone or baritone or tuba, they might be phenomenal because big lips are like a plus on, on those instruments. So there, there's there's things like that that I can help a student kind of you know pick out. Most of the time, there aren't any physical issues that with, with a student playing an instrument. The only physical issue that they'd have in middle school is maybe they want to play trombone and their arm is not long enough to get to seventh position. And I'm like, that's going to change as you get older. So let's just not worry about that. Your B naturals when you go out there are never going to be in tune until your arm gets long enough, but we can deal with that. By the time you get to high school and it's going to matter more, you'll probably be, your arm will be long enough to, you know, to do that. So that's kind of the limitations that you'll usually have as, um, as in middle school, certainly as a sixth grader. And so when I meet with them, we kind of go over some of those things. But most of the time, if a student wants to play something, I'm like, here's what here's what you do. And then what I tell them, I say, OK, go home and um, go on YouTube and find some people playing the instrument professionals, because, you know, anybody can put anything on YouTube and say, hey, I'm a saxophone player. Mm -hmm. And you listen to it and you go, oh, no, you're not. Right. So um, I tell them to go find someone who's a reputable person, even if they need to do a Google search of is this person legit? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. OK, yeah. And then listen to them and that tells them like, okay, if you stuck with this instrument and you learned, learned it really, really well, that's where you could be. And that's what it sounds like when a professional plays it. And that's how pretty this, the instrument is. So like, it's certainly if they're kind of like, I don't know if I want to play cello or violin, I go, go home and listen to what each of those two instruments sound like. And hopefully one of them will speak to you and you'll be like, oh, that is so beautiful. Now with, with us in the, COVID, so that's how I would normally do it. With us, with COVID, we can't meet the one-on-one -on -one thing. So um, I haven't had anybody yet ask me about that because usually it happens in spring, like March. Yeah, March and, and to the end of the year is usually when students are, are making appointments to see me and make this decision, sometimes in February. So um, I would say that if a student is interested, um, have them or the parent contact me. Um, 
first thing I'll probably tell them to do the same thing about going on YouTube. I right? think about the instruments you want to listen to um, or want to play, listen to professionals, play it. So at least you can get narrow it down to something else. Um, and then we can, we can meet and discuss it and talk about it. Um, yeah, this year is just going to be different just because I can't meet the one-on-one -on -one and they're not going to be able to try out the instruments. They might, I don't know, but they might be able to go to a music store and try them out. Um, but I'm not positive. I, I, I could see that not being possible also, but I don't want to speak for the music stores about if they're allow that to happen or not. I would assume because of the aerosols that come out of an instrument, unless it's a string instrument that they're not going to be able to be able to do that. So, um, I would say if you want to play an instrument or if you're interested in playing an instrument next year, first contact me, let's kind of have a conversation about, um, where you are, what you think you might want to play, um, or even what family, or if you have no idea, then um, I can maybe even point you in the right direction for some YouTube videos or whatever to get you kind of, oh, okay, that, that, that. But really, if you're going to play an instrument, one, you have to pick an instrument that you are going to dedicate to practicing and you want to learn and you want to be good at playing that instrument. If you're not really if you sign up to play an instrument because your parents played clarinet and you have a clarinet at home, but you're like, eh, I'm not really into clarinet. You're not going to, you're not going to be good at the instrument because you're not going to try. You're not going to care about it because you, you are not the person who wants to do it. You're doing it. You're playing that instrument because your parents had it. And right. sometimes people do that and they're successful and they're like, yeah, I didn't really want to do it. But you know what? Once I got into it, it was like, yeah, cool. Like the way I got into it, uh, into playing is I went to my sister's middle school concert. I think she was in seventh grade at the time. I don't remember. And I heard the drummer play one of the, I don't remember what piece it was, but the drummer played. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to do that. And uh, my wife, her story, wow, I didn't know. she was, she was, I think she was, at, she went to a music store or, or she went to, I don't remember exactly where she was, but they're like, okay, pick out what instrument you want to play. And it had all the instruments out there. And on the wall, there was a, uh, a, a clarinet and I don't remember if it was a different color or something, but she's like, I want to play that. So she saw it and she, she wanted to play that. So sometimes you'll look at it and say, I want to play that. I always say, listen to what it sounds like because, um, by a good person, because like, if you want to play oboe and you heard a middle school student who was a beginner play oboe, you would go, Oh, never mind, I'm not gonna play that instrument. But if you hear a professional who's been playing a long time, play it, then you go, Oh, that's what it sounds like because it's not going to that instrument's not going to sound very good for a few years, like the tone of it and everything, because it takes a long time to build that up. Um, but uh, yeah, so you have to be committed to wanting to hear it, to, to play it. You need to like the sound of the instrument because you're going to have to spend a lot of time listening to it. Right. Um, and you want to you want to have to you want to work on that. I mean, some kids will play will pick an instrument and they, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to do it. They're committed. And partway through the year, there's kind of like, eh. I'm not really down with this. And usually I try to say, okay, well, what do you want to play? And then uh, a lot of times they'll switch to something else. And they're more successful with that because they, you know, now they've been in band for part of the year. So they've heard a bunch of instruments and, and whatever. And they've heard people talk about playing the instruments and they know some of the, the dif difficulties of the instruments and some of the easy stuff of the instruments at that point. So they're like, oh, okay, well, I want to switch to trumpet now. Okay, are you sure we, we we can try that, um, and we can transition sometimes midway through the year, or sometimes they'll be like, okay, seventh grade, I'm going to play the trumpet. All right, sounds good. Let's do it. So, so that's um, they're like allowed to change like what instrument they want to play like mid year if they feel um, like. Yeah it it depends it depends on what instrument they're playing and what the scenario is. So some students, I, I've in the past I've said. No, let's switch it seventh grade year just because we're getting ready for a concert or whatever. Spring's hard to switch because we have a lot more concerts, right? We have to get ready from January to March. We're usually getting ready for um, the area band festival and the area string festival. And then right after that, we have to get ready for the spring concert. So if you're trying to start a new instrument that if you're going from like clarinet to trumpet, they're completely different. The fingerings are different. The mouthpiece is different. The only things that are the same is you're reading treble clef and you have to use air everything else is different. So trying to switch that and learn music that's harder than what we were doing in the beginning of the year is a difficult thing to do. I've, I've had students do that, but normally if they're gonna switch in mid-year, 
I'm going, okay, let's switch from alto to tenor sax, or let's switch from trumpet to French horn, or let's switch you know, from brass to another brass, or from a woodwind to another woodwind, so that there are a lot of similarities with it, and then it makes it an easier transition. So if a student wants to completely do a 180 and switch completely what they're going to do, then, then usually I'll be like, okay, let's, let's start working on that this year with the plan that when we come back in fall, you're going to play that instrument, but let's you and I start working on how you play that instrument now and rent it now or borrow it from the school or whatever. And let's go about the process of you um, learning that instrument in spring. And then when you come back in fall and you work on it over summer, when you come back in fall, you're going to feel like, all right, I'm ready to do this. Right. That's reasonable. Yeah. Um, would you suggest renting or buying an instrument? Because like not all bands offer instruments. Um, so um, I would, and I, I think most music te uh, teachers would, would say, say this also. I would say, unless you have access to an instrument, I would rent it until you know that you're going to play that instrument for a long period of time because instruments are an investment <clears throat> i mean the cheapest instrument of good quality in a band the cheapest instrument of good quality in a band is probably six hundred dollars that's the cheapest version of whatever instrument you want to pick in the band um regardless of of percussion because you can you can get you know like a snare drum set that's decent ish for a couple hundred dollars but um if you're looking at a flute or a trumpet or a saxophone or um, a trombone or a tuba or anything like that, um, you're looking at probably $600 minimum. And that's a pretty big investment. Um, if you're looking at strings, you can get them for less, maybe $300 to $400. You can get a, a pretty good beginner violin. And for, I don't know, maybe $400 or so, you could probably get a pretty good cello. And for about six to eight hundred dollars, you could probably get an oh, decent bass um, and that kind of thing. But um, a lot of times uh, people will go out and they'll go, oh, Costco has a flute and it's a hundred bucks. Well, I have a garbage can and that's where I would put that flute because that's where it belongs. Uh -huh. those, those those instruments that are that cheap are that cheap for a reason. And if it, if it so I, I say shouldn't say if it breaks when it breaks shortly and you take it to the shop to get it fixed, they'll be like, I'm not touching that. It's not worth it. And you might end up paying more than $100 for the repair of that when you're like, you might as well just have gotten a better instrument. And they don't hold value. So if you ever decide you don't want to play, you're, you're not going to be able to sell it. If you got a Yamaha flute and paid $800 for it or whatever, I don't know what the going rate is. And um, you you went through high school and everything. So you played it for six, seven years. And you're like, yeah, you know, I love, I love playing music, but um, I'm, I'm not going to continue on with it. Or you continue on and you're like, that was my beginner flute. Now I have this, this professional flute because I'm going to go into college and I, I want to play more, but I need a better instrument, but I'm going to sell my old one so I can buy a new one. You can still, the, the retention of that, people are still going to want that instrument and you can still get money for that instrument. If you have like a first act or something that you got at Target, people aren't going to want to pay anything for that. And right. like if you came to me and said, Hey, I have a free flute. I want to give you, I'd be like, what am I going to do with that? You know, mm -hmm. I could put it up on the wall and say, look, I have flute art, but that's all that I'm going to use. Yeah. it." For. So, um, also a lot of, uh, most of actually all the places that I know of that rent instruments, at least for the first year of your contract, you can rent to own, which means if you, um, whatever you put into your rental for that first year per month, at the end of the year, if you're like, oh, I want to buy that instrument, then they will take either that whole amount or a percentage of that amount that you paid for renting and they'll apply it for you to buy a new instrument. So oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So you get kind of a discount of that. So if you paid, let's say you paid 30 or $40 a month in rental fees for a trumpet at the end of the year, your, your kid was like, yeah, and this is sixth grade. And they'd be like, yeah, you know what? I think, I think I want to do this definitely through eighth grade. And I'll probably do it in high school because it sounds like a fun thing to do. I'm going to continue on with that. And the parents were like, okay, then you know what? Well, it's a $1,200 instrument and we've already, you know, paid whatever per month. And then the, the um, music store, I don't know if they'll give you a hundred percent of what you put into it, but they usually will have some kind of percentage or whatever. And then they'll say, okay, so we're going to knock off a couple hundred dollars off of that because you paid the rental. So now you've gotten, you know, a discount basically 
you didn't because you paid the money. But you know, at the time, yeah, you, you have that discount kind of in it because you already paid. You already paid for that. So then you're kind of like, all right, cool. Um, the thing with that is though, it's usually only the first year. So if you rent for multiple years, usually it doesn't. That doesn't apply. Um, I have known. I think some uh, places will go like two years, but that's the highest. So if you rent for a long period of time, you're not going to have that kind of investment, but you're going to have, um, you're going to have that you haven't spent all that money all at once for an instrument. Certainly if your student decides, I don't really want to play it on the strings end. If you're playing violin or viola, if you're a sixth grader, you're not, you they have different sizes. You're not on a full size violin yet because you have to grow. Unless you're a big sixth grader with long arms and long fingers, um, you're not going to be big enough yet to play a full size violin. So you're going to have to have a half size or a three quarter size. So if you buy one now, there's a good chance that next year you're going to have to buy another one because it has to be bigger. And the next year you might have to buy another one. So I suggest if you're a string player, just to rent until you're at full size, which usually for most middle school students, by the time they're an eighth grader, they'll probably be on a full size violin. So I always say, all right, so just just once you're at a full size violin or cello or whatever, then then purchase it um, if you're if you're going to continue on, because then you can keep that at, up and through adulthood. You know, um, at the same time, string instruments are a lot cheaper. I've seen some pretty decent ones that you can get for like two hundred dollars. And I'm like, that's really not that bad. And you could probably have some retail value of that when you're done with it um, or donate it to a school or something like that, you know, when you're, when you're done. So, um, yeah, I, I recommend renting before you buy. <clears throat> um, if it's a big instrument, usually the schools will have, have some you can borrow. So, um, like for us, if you're playing, uh, trombone or tuba or cello or bass, um, like the upright bass, we have those at school because they're cumbersome to just have at home. Um, even some students will have, like most of the cello players we have, they have a cello at home. And so we provide a cello at school so they don't have to bring them back and forth. Because the cello oh, yeah. is, you know, as some of them, it's basically almost as tall as they are. And that's that's kind of a pain to bring back and forth, certainly if you're taking a bus or whatever. So mm -hmm. um, if we have an instrument at school that we can loan out to a student, then I will definitely do that. Um, and normally, like we have some flutes and clarinets, but normally flutes and clarinet players, they have one, either they're renting it or whatever. And quite frankly, all of our flutes and clarinets are pretty old and they need repair and they work, but they're not the, in the best shape. So um, sometimes you're better off just renting because you know you're going to get a good instrument. And if something breaks, that's not your, like you don't drop it, but some a pad falls off or something, you take it in, they just repair it. It's You don't have to pay for that because you're renting it. And that instrument's just, you know, it's kind of old. It's going to, things are going to happen to it and they'll fix it. If you drop it on the ground or run over it with a car, that's different. Mm -hmm. But if you, um, if it's just kind of normal wear and tear, they, they'll fix it for you free of charge because that's part of the agreement of the um, contract. Yeah. I remember like when I started band in elementary school, like, yeah, we started out with like renting a trumpet from a local music store. And then once I was sure that I really wanted to play the trumpet, we bought the trumpet. So yeah, I completely agree. Um, so also, how are like the school music programs funded in California and our school district? Does like yeah. enrollment play a factor? Um, enrollment plays a factor in the classes that we get. So as for instance, um, when I first started at Pine Valley, we had one orchestra class that was a full, it was a full orchestra. So it had strings and it had uh, wind instruments and it had percussion. And I think that class was 23 students or something. And there were about 12 of them that were strings. So we had 12 string students at the whole school, 12. And then I, uh, I would meet in the mornings for a period. I met with sixth grade band for, I think two days. And then we met, I met with sixth grade strings for two days and then Wednesday, cause it was a late start. I didn't meet with anybody. Um, and then the following year, uh, I started the, the sixth grade band cause we had enough students to, to, to do that. So Mr. Law said, Oh, all right, we have enough. Great. Let's build the program. And so he gave me another class. I was like, yes, good. And so then I still saw sixth grade strings in the morning. 
Um, and I think I only did that for another year because it wasn't very successful seeing them for a period or after school. I think I tried both of them. So then um, our strings got enough that we went to, we got enough string students that we went to a full uh, an orchestra with no wind players. And then um, part of the reason we did that is I started to have un incoming sixth graders joined the orchestra so they could, they could uh, play in the orchestra with the seventh and eighth graders. And then that grew into uh, where I had so many students that I had too many seventh and eighth graders and sixth graders that I couldn't put them in one class. So then we were able to get another class for just sixth grade and seventh and eighth grade. And then two years ago, the seventh and eighth grade got to a point where it grew. So now that's split up into two. So now we have a sixth grade strings and two seventh and eighth grade strings, as well as a sixth grade band and two seventh and eighth grade bands, which is how my, my job went from uh, teaching two classes at Pine Valley to now teaching six is because, oh. because the numbers went up. And so as our numbers go up, then um, that constitutes us being able to have more classes because we have the students able to do that. And we have the, um, the interest for the students to be taking those classes. And then um, as, as far as, so that's what the district covers or that's what the school covers or that's what they, they um, basically they're covering for my job. They're covering paying for me to teach. As far as instruments and music, um, instrument repairs, um, anything that we need to purchase for our, for our program, that comes from parent donations and fundraising that we do. Um, and sometimes it'll come from, which I guess is the same thing, but sometimes it'll come from EdFund, like we'll ask EdFund for help or PTA for help in purchasing an instrument or purchasing a certain, certain something, and they'll help us with that. They'll either give us part of the money or they'll buy it for us or whatever. Um, and that comes from parent donations to those particular um, institutions uh, uh, or programs. And so um, then we do fundraising. Um, and sometimes we just do fundraising, which I, I usually purchase uh, 1500 to $2,000 worth of just music every year, at Whoa. least. Um, because our, when I got there, the, the program, we didn't have a lot of music and I, you know, I've been there 10 years and I've been, um, slowly building it up, but over the last, I don't know, at least four years, I probably spent around $2,000 each year, except for this year, because of different circumstances, I usually spend about $2,000 on sheet music every year. And part yeah. of that is we've gotten more classes. So each class, you know, for each class has four pieces they play for each concert. Um, and they have four or five concerts per year. So, and each, each uh, piece of music, if we buy new ones, each piece of music is costing 60 to $80 just, just to have us for us to, to purchase that. So one concert for one group, it will cost us a couple hundred dollars just, just for them to play a winter concert. And I will, and then, you know, you cycle through. So every four years or five years, I might play the same song um, that I did mm -hmm. four years ago because the people in our program never played it. And the people, maybe they're seniors in high school and they'll come to our concert. Oh, I remember when I played that song, but you know, it's been a lot of years. So even the people coming to the concert, they, they may not remember that we did it. Yeah. And for me, you know, working on a piece of music that we go over and over and over and over and over and over. If I give it a rest for four or five years and it comes back, I'm like, Oh, I remember that song. That was awesome. I want to do that again. Woohoo. Um, so we'll, we'll put, we'll put it back into rotation every few years, but you don't want to play the same music every year. So, yeah. um, and especially with string music, we don't have a lot of string music. So the last two years I've been purchasing music, like every, almost every single piece that we've played in the last couple of years for strings, I purchased it. Cause we don't, like everything that was in our music library, we've already played within the last couple of years. So I'm like, okay, we need new music. Um, so I've slowly built that up. And so now we have some repertoire in there. And then once we joined, once we started having the sixth grade strings as an actual class, which has only been a couple of years, we don't have a lot of music that's uh, rated for, for them to play. So I've had to, you know, get the music for them for that. So uh, all of the stuff besides Basically, besides teach, uh, paying for me to teach, everything else that we purchase and we do, we have to do through fundraising. Um, basically, it's all through parent support. So fundraising, oh, wow. parent support, or donations at the beginning of the year. Um, those, that's how we we get funded. And our community is is 
is very nice to our program, to all of our programs, but to our music program, especially they're very, um, they give us donations at the beginning of the year and they are very supportive when we have fundraisers and, and helping out with that. Um, and certainly when we have a cause like, Hey, we want to buy a bass clarinet. We had to do that a couple of years ago. And we're like, okay, we're raising money for a bass clarinet. This fundraiser is for a bass clarinet and this fundraiser. And hopefully with those two fundraisers, we can raise uh, the, the $2,000 or whatever we need to buy this bass clarinet. All right, cool. Let's do it. And then we'll do that. And sometimes we'll be like, Oh, we're so close. We're just a little bit short. Then Ed fund will come in and say, all right, you know what? We're going to, we're going to give you the rest of that money. We're like, yay. Thank you. Red fund. So, um, a lot of times it's, it's working with PTA, Ed Fund, and then the fundraising and then the donations that we have uh, within the year. So that's kind of how we get funded. So the actual class is being funded by the district, um, but everything that we do in the class um, and we purchase for the class and the instruments and everything, that's all funded through parent donations and fundraising, which is also parent donations, making it to the fundraisers. Oh, cool. Um, so speaking of like all those bands like i remember in sixth grade it was overwhelming to hear like all those options such as string cadet band orchestra so what different band groups are there like what are the differences between each of the band groups and do these band groups vary from school to school um yeah so not all the schools in our district have exactly the same groups but the ones that do, they kind of run the same sort of way. So at Pine Valley though, we have, so I was mentioning before, we have um, sixth grade band and sixth grade strings. So the instruments I said before that are the band instruments are in the band um, and the instruments in the strings are in the strings class. So we have one each of sixth grade uh, band and strings. And then for uh, the, in the strings, we have orchestra and we have chamber orchestra. So orchestra is seventh and eighth grade and chamber orchestra is seventh and eighth grade. Uh, the difference between the two of them is that chamber orchestra is an audition class. So you have to audition to be in there. Um, so the students who are in that class um, usually have a, a little bit more experience playing. Um, they can play a little bit harder music. Some of them take private lessons. So they're a little bit further ahead with that. So we play a little bit more challenging music. Um, and so my expectation of, of the students in that class is a little bit higher because it should be because they should be able to handle a little bit um, higher music. The band kind of works the same way. We have concert band, which is seventh and eighth grade, and symphonic band, which is seventh and eighth grade. So symphonic band is the same thing like chamber orchestra, but band where it's audition based. We play harder music. Um, we play more music, and um, my expectations of of the level of that they're playing, I have a little bit higher expectations of where they are, just because the students in there should have more experience and should be able to play the um, play that music. Um, and they did that audition process to get there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I was in symphonic band, so yeah, I remember like having to audition and mm -hmm. yeah, it was a cool process. So I feel like this is probably a lingering question which many families have. How do you think band will look like in the year of 2021 to 2022? Um, that's a good I know yeah, this is probably yeah. a difficult question to answer. But. Yeah. Um, so I guess the quick answer is I don't know mm -hmm. because we don't know what where we're going to be. Um, it's very difficult teaching a performance-based class virtually when you can't perform. And I can't hear everybody all at once. So, um, I mean, we're making it through and I'm able to hear students and whatnot, but we're not able to do what we normally do. So ideally... If everything goes well, will we? Everyone will be back at school in a normal circumstance where everyone's going to go to all their classes and they're going to attend it, and we'll be able to play and we'll be able to have concerts. So it'll be kind of like it has been in in the past, where we we get there, we kind of have some get to know yous, um, and as a sixth grader, I start you out and see where everybody is, and then we kind of grow from there. We have um, a fall concert, a winter concert, so a fall concert in October, a winter concert in December. We have a uh, area band and string festival in March, and we have a spring concert in May, maybe some other stuff um, within there also. That would be the ideal normal kind of circumstance with with all of that. So I'm planning for that to be the case mm -hmm. at, at this point. I mean, I ask myself every day, what's it gonna look like next year? So I, I'm planning for it to be pretty normal next year, maybe with some restrictions, um, but, as a pretty normal um, 
normal, at least as far as the classes go, pretty normal. As far as concerts go, we may not be able to have large crowds for concerts still. I don't know. But if the students can be there, we can always do like a virtual concert or what, whatnot. And that could still work. Like we could play and record it or YouTube it or whatever, live stream it. And that could be an option for that. So uh, as of right now, I don't know. Um, but I'm hoping that everything will be uh, at least yeah. somewhat back to normal with maybe with yeah, some, let's hope so. Yeah. if not, we'll probably kind of do what we're doing now with, we meet, you know, we have student support. So if students need help with things, we do that. We play every day, but I don't get to hear everybody play every day. Um, so it takes longer to fix issues and whatnot and learn music and, and do things. And, you know, we're not doing any concerts right now, so we don't get to have any end goal, which is, you know, Hey, we're going to learn this music so we can perform it um so yeah right now i don't know but i'm hoping that it will be normalish next year mm -hmm.